All right, let's look at some U substitution with some other uh, more complicated techniques than just your basic introductory substitution. And so the first one we're going to look at is something I call double substitution. I don't know if it, that's really a name. It's really just substitution. But if you look at this problem, x root 1 plus x, it's not a straightforward power rule. It's not something I recognize. So my next integration technique that I consider is u sub. And the only viable choice for u in this one would be the 1 plus x. So I find my u, or I pick a u. Then the very next thing I do is I want to establish du, the derivative of that u would just be 1 dx. And before you do any substitution, any other substitution, make sure you substitute the du first. And I do have du right here. So the fact that I was able to identify my du tells me that I'm okay to proceed with substitution. So I'm going to do that. Starting with my du, so I take the dx out, I put du in its place, then I look at everything that remains, and I see a 1 plus x, that will be replaced by u, so instead of square root of 1 plus x, I'll have the square root of u, but here's where we run into a little bit of a problem, I have started taking my x's out and turning them into their equivalent u expression, however, I still have one x remaining in the problem that has not been accounted for, and we can fix this. This isn't the wrong choice for you. This will be fixable. But you do need to remember that all acts of substitution are just algebra. You're just taking one thing out and replacing it with something else that is equal to that thing. And so as long as you're in the world of algebra, as long as you're in the world of algebra, you can do whatever you want as long as your algebra is good. So I'm going to take this expression right here. If u is equal to 1 plus x, I could move that 1 over and say that x is equal to u minus 1. And if I know that x is equal to u minus 1, then I can take u minus 1 if it's equal to x, and I can substitute that in for the x. And when I do that, I will have the antiderivative of u minus 1 times the square root of u, which is u to the 1 half, du. And now I have successfully substituted everything uh, and I call that double substitution or dub sub for short. And it just means that, that you're going to have to manipulate your u equals expression and substitute something else in for maybe a lone x that is still remaining. Uh, so once I've done that, I now look at my new antiderivative. It's a whole new problem. And I want to figure out how I'm going to do this problem. And this problem should not be too incredibly difficult. It is fractiony, but we can now just distribute that u to the one half and turn this into a power rule. So I'm going to pause this and finish working out the antiderivative really quick. And when we come back, we will see what the answer is. There's our answer, a nice little power rule. Don't forget you add exponents when you distribute. So that would be u to the 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. Add 1, divide by 5 halves, it gives you 2 fifths. And then you substitute your u's back in once you find the antiderivative. So there's example number 1. Let's look at another one. We have x squared times the quantity x minus 3 to the fifth. Um, again, it's not a direct power rule, and I don't recognize it. So now I jump into u sub, and the only thing that I see that would be a reasonable choice for u is this x minus 3 inside the parentheses. So I have u is x minus 3, but before I do anything else, I'm going to make sure that my du is accounted for, and the derivative of x minus 3 is 1 dx. And that can be substituted because 1 dx is right here at the end. So I see my du. That means I can proceed with substitution to see if this works out. And so I start by substituting du in for that dx. Stick it way over here. Give me room to squeeze everything else in. So I have du. I notice that I have x minus 3 to the fifth. So that x minus 3 will replace, or I'm sorry, the u will replace the x minus 3. So instead of x minus 3 to the 5th, I see u to the 5th, and now, like the last problem, I still have remaining x's to deal with, so I want to figure out if there is anything I can do to substitute that x out, and we can because this is an easy u equals x minus 3, that is easy to solve for x, and if u is x minus 3, then x equals u plus 3, and that u plus 3 will then replace the x right here. And when I make that substitution, we then will reset and see if we can figure out how to finish that antiderivative. So let me substitute that in. So we have x squared will be 
u plus 3 squared times u to the fifth. And this is still kind of ugly, and it's very similar to the original problem. However, when I look at this, after I've done that substitution, I'm going to ignore the rest so it doesn't pollute my mind. Um, this problem, while still ugly, it's not as hard to expand. u plus 3 squared is pretty easy to do, and then we can distribute a u to the fifth relatively easily, unlike the initial one where we would have had to expand x minus 3 to the fifth, which would have been really, really painful. So once again, I'm going to pause this, and when we come back, we will see the final answer for number two. And there we go. There's our answer for number two. A little bit of expansion, distributed my u to the fifth. Uh, the, I did reduce my nine over six here to three halves, and then you substitute back in, and that is your answer. Pretty ugly, but that is how u sub works for this problem. And so let's look at some u subs. Uh, in the world of, uh, or in the context of uh, definite integrals. So here I have x, 3 plus x squared, all to the fourth. Uh, and if you remember, even with easier antiderivatives, you don't think about the, in, the limits of integration until after you find the antiderivative, and this is no different. So we're going to start by just finding the antiderivative of this. It is a u sub, and this one's a fairly straightforward u sub. We'll let u equal 3 plus x squared du is going to be 2x dx, and so I want to identify my du. Uh, I have the x dx, I'm missing the 2, so I can fix that. I'll put a 2 here and a 1 half out here, and so now I can substitute, and I have 1 half antiderivative. The 2x dx comes out and becomes a du. The 3 plus x squared will become a u to the fourth, and there is our antiderivative. I'm sorry, there is our uh, mu integral. So uh, we need to now find the antiderivative of that, which will be one half of u to the fifth over five, which then we can substitute our u in, and so we end up with three plus x squared to the fifth over, and I'll go ahead and say two times five is ten, so that antiderivative hopefully was not too difficult. Uh, I did not put my plus c because, remember, this is a definite integral. So let me erase the white out here. So let me look at my limits of integration again. So it was an upper limit of 1 and a lower limit of, limit of 0. So now I have to substitute 0 and 1 in here. And what you need to remember is that 0 and 1 are values of x. Those are values of x. So you do not want to put 0 and 1 here because this integral is in terms of u. We're not going to put 0 and 1 here because that may confuse you and you may be tempted to plug in 0 and 1 for the u when they should be plugged in for x. So I will not put my limits of integration on this step right here, but I will bring them back here and evaluate from 0 to 1, and these are fairly easy ones to evaluate. 3 plus 1 to the fifth. I don't feel like evaluating that. I think it's 243 all over 10 minus, and if you plug in 0, th 3 plus 1 would be 4, not 3. So 4 to the fifth over 10 minus, and if I plug in 0, 3 plus 0 is 3 to the fifth over 10, and we'll stop right there. We're not going to evaluate that, but there is our answer for this problem. So, so nothing new there. It's a normal u substitution, and in the end, you just have to plug in the limits of integration. However, there is another way that you can solve a definite integral in the world of u substitution, and that's why I wanted to do this problem. And the first few steps, when you do it the other way, are the exact same. So when we work this out in another way, we're still going to have to pick our u. We're going to have to make the du happen. And notice I'm at the same point I was before, only this time I'm going to change my limits of integration. My limits of integration for x are 0 and 1, and if x is 0 and x is 1, and I know that u is equal to 3 plus x squared, then I have the ability to convert the limits of integration if x is equal to 0, then u is going to equal 3 plus 0 squared, which is 3. So my lower limit of integration in terms of u is 3. And if x is 1, then u could be 3 plus 1 squared, 
and three plus one squared is four. And so I'm converting my limits of integration earlier in the problem. And if you make that conversion, then we can actually finish the problem completely without ever looking back at my first steps. I now have a complete definite integral that I can solve without looking at my u equals whatever it was. I've already forgotten what it was. So when we find this antiderivative, it's u to the fifth over five. I'm going to evaluate that from three to four. And there is a one half in front. There is a one half in front. So when I substitute, I think, again, I'm going to go ahead and say two times five is 10. And when I substitute, it's pretty easy. Now I'll plug in four, four to the fifth over the two times five is 10 minus plug in three, three to the fifth over the two times five, which is 10. And you get the exact same answer. You get the exact same answer that you would the other way. And it's really not a whole lot of different work. You're, you're doing the same amount of work. So the changing the limits of integration doesn't make the problem any shorter. All you're doing is changing when you plug one and zero into three plus x squared. For the first time I worked it, I plugged into one and zero to three plus x squared at the end. This time, I still plugged in one and zero to three plus x squared. I just did it kind of in the middle. Um, and if it's a free response question, or if the answer choices are numbers, then it doesn't really matter which way you do this. However, on the AP exam, they can ask you multiple choice questions that force you into the, the steps where you have to convert the limits of integration. And this is an example of one of those. So notice they're asking you about the antiderivative from one to three of two X cosine X squared, but notice the answer choices are not the actual numeric value. It's just what would be the U integral that is equivalent to this one. So here, we're gonna start solving this like we would a normal U substitution. I see X squared on the inside, so U is X squared. My DU is going to be 2X DX. And before I do anything else, I want to identify the DU and 2X DX is already in this problem, so that's really nice of them. So when I start substituting, I will have the antiderivative I have the antiderivative, the two X DX comes out and becomes a DU. My cosine of X squared becomes cosine of U. And so I'm looking for cosine U DU, that eliminates D and E. And now we have to make sure the limits of integration are correct and we have to convert those. So now I'm gonna take those values of one and three, which are values of X and I have to convert those. So I'm gonna convert the limits with the expression, like we know that u is equal to x squared. And so if x is equal to one, then u is equal to one squared, which is one. So my lower limit of integration is one. And if x is equal to three, then u is equal to three squared, which is obviously nine. So I'm looking for the integral from one to nine of cosine u, and that is b. So they can word questions in a way that force you to know to convert the limits of integration. Usually, well, I don't say usually, but it's not uncommon for them to tell you what u is. A lot of times they'll say using the substitution u equals x squared, which of these is the equivalent expression. Um, and in that case, and really I should have in this case, probably the first thing you should do is convert the limits of integration. The second you know that u is equal to x squared, go ahead and convert the limits of integration immediately one squared and three squared would obviously give you one and nine. And if you do that, if you convert the limits of integration first, you immediately eliminate three of these five options and you're only down to B and D. So it helps you out if you go ahead and convert those limits first. Um, and then you can worry about the, the U substitution part later. So I have one more example I wanna look at, one more example. And this is in the world of uh, rational functions, which just means you have a fraction of two polynomials. And this one could be solved with u sub, I'm not gonna do that, but it could be solved with u sub equals x plus one. Um, your du is dx, which is right here. So I could plug du in there. I could plug u in here. And then we could dub sub to plug in, at, uh, we would plug in u minus one for that x. Then you would have to expand, you would have to uh, STD or, or simplify that, that fraction. And it's a little bit problematic. There is an easier way on this one u sub would work. However, when you have a rational expression, you really, really, really want the top degree to be less 
than the bottom degree. You do not want the top degree of a rational function to be equal to the bottom or greater than the bottom when you're doing antiderivatives. So there you go, a little note to yourself. You want the top degree to be less than the bottom degree. And if it is not, in this case, my top degree is larger than the bottom, or even if it were equal, I would still want to fix this. You fix this problem with either long or synthetic division. So we're going to use division to fix this. Okay, so this problem I set up so that it can be synthetically divided. So I'm going to divide x plus 1 into x squared minus 2. So I'll be negative 1 into, I have 1x squared, no x's, and a negative 2. We'll bring down the 1, negative 1 times 1, 0 minus 1, negative 1 times 1 is 1, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. That's your remainder. And when I divided that, I was left with the expression x minus 1 minus 1 over my remainder. I guess I could say plus my remainder of negative 1 over x plus 1. And that now is going to be my new antiderivative. So I'm rewriting it. Instead of having the big fraction, I now have rewritten it so it's x minus 1 plus that. Um, and now I think I will, even though I just fixed this, I am going to change that to minus 1 over x plus 1. And when you do that, we now can look at each one of those pieces individually and find the antiderivatives. And all three of these should be easy, although that last one may trip you up a little bit. The first one, the antiderivative of x is simply x squared over 2 minus the antiderivative of 1 is x. And for this fraction, if you ever are doing the antiderivative of a fraction, the first thing I recommend you look at is the denominator and see if the top is the derivative of the bottom. And in this case, the derivative of x plus 1 is 1. So that means this is a natural log. The top is the derivative of the bottom. So minus the natural log of x plus 1. Put a plus c, and there is your answer. So there was no substitution at all needed. You could have u subbed it. However, um, it's easier to ju just do synthetic or long division to rewrite the rational expression. And you will always do that if the top degree is equal to or greater than the bottom. And that forces you into a new rational expression where the top degree is less. So there we go. We're at 17 and a half minutes and, or close to that. And I'm tired of doing this pro these problems. So there we go. Hopefully it helps.